Blessings, everyone. This is your brother Asar M. Hotep with the Madhu Indela Institute for the Advancement of Science and Culture. And I am here today on what is this? Friday, May the 22nd, uh, 2020, still in COVID 19 isolation. And today is an unplanned show. Uh, and it's not really like a full show. I'm just decided to hop on the internet real quick because I received in the mail today um, a new book. So, you know, every now and then when I receive books that I think, you know, are interesting, uh, I may come and just do a live and um, share the new book. And the book may not always be new as far as it just came out right then and there. Uh, it just may be new to me in terms of my collection. So, but the, the book that I'm talking about today is actually new, new, like it came out yesterday. And matter of fact, this book was supposed to be at my house yesterday. But uh, Amazon Prime was on something else, so it did not come in until early this morning. So uh, the book that I'm speaking of today is Ancient Egyptian Phonology by James P. Allen. And for those of you who are familiar with the Sesh Medinetra, or the Egyptian hieroglyphic system of ancient Kemet, um, you will be familiar with this name because he has written, you know, one of the more well-known grammar books uh, concerning the the ancient Egyptian, more specifically the Middle Egyptian uh, language, and and I actually think he has a uh, an old Egyptian, old Kingdom Egyptian. Uh, text too. So I pre-ordered this book at the beginning of the year. So, you know, before you knew it, it was May 21st and the book was released. And so because I have Amazon Prime, um, I got mine in a timely fashion. So even though it was late, technically. Uh, so, you know, this is a book, he wrote a book back in 2013 concerning the linguistics of the Egyptian, um, Middle Egyptian, Late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic, uh, so-called phases of the language. And so he decides recently to just create a book dedicated to the phonology. And so phonology, for those who aren't familiar, 
is dealing with the sounds, the systematic study of the sounds of a language. And so the reason why this is an important text and an important subject, nonetheless, is that we don't know how the ancient Egyptian language sounded. And so although we have the script and we have a an inkling of knowledge in terms of what the sounds of the language and how they map to the writing script um, were is 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 not exact, and so it's it's hard to be exact in that sense. Why? I mean, why? Because uh, there was no recording. They had no YouTube. They had no uh, cell phones and recording devices, and so you don't really have a sense of you know what it sounds like. And not only that, the language is not spoken in the modern era. So, you know, any of the the deep nuances in terms of how language is spoken uh, are missed. So it becomes kind of like a treasure hunt to to see what the sounds were. And so that, you know, you can actually speak the ancient Egyptian language. And so, you know, the Holy Grail, just like in physics, how you have the grand unified field theory, like that's one of the Holy Grails of astro and quantum physics, you know, the reproduction of the ancient Egyptian Middle, e Middle Kingdom and Late Kingdom language and sounds so that when we speak, we're not just speaking in what we call Egyptology speak. And so what, what I mentioned, but or I, I don't know if I have mentioned this, but if I haven't mentioned it, I'll say it now. And that is the ancient Egyptian language, languages, uh, so to speak, only have the consonants in terms of the graphemes. Uh, the graphemes represent consonants. So the vowels are missing. So, you know, the, the vowels is kind of like the, the meat of the language and so without that vocalizing the language is um, almost next to impossible if you don't know what the vowels are so as a result egyptologists when they write they normally just stick a random arbitrary e sound in between the vowels because it's hard to pronounce something if we're having a conversation about ancient Egyptian and there is no vowels. So imagine trying to, you know, pronounce all consonants like it just doesn't make any sense. You need vowels. So, um, you, so normally when you're reading ancient Egyptian writing and, you know, you will see like scholars uh, pronunciating the word, that's not how it's pronunciated. They are just arbitrarily sticking an E in the uh, in between the consonants. So this is James P. Allen's attempt at trying to hone in on the pronunciation of the ancient Egyptian uh, language and its phases. And so um, this is not a book review because, again, it just came in the mail today. So um, but I did get a chance to gloss over it and to read two of the chapters. And so um, before I continue, I just want to say uh, welcome everyone who has, you know, made it to the chat. Uh, I see Omar Reed. I see Brother Wujawu. I see Sister Mika. I see Master Kalik, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> um, R.C. Moabite, Jarrell Amade, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
Brother Chavez, Tep Haseb, Ahawi McRae, or McCray, um, Zen Garden, Shaka Plus, Jaga Davis, and I think I got everyone in the chat, and I see Jones one, and that's on the uh, what do you call it? The YouTube uh, chat. So, um, so peace to everyone and everyone who is watching on YouTube. So, um, so one of the things that I noticed, uh, Brother Wujawu says that his came in today uh, as well. And Brother Wujawu, if you are available um, and want to join in, uh, let me know and I will send you the link to join the panel. <laughs> so let me get back here to StreamYard. So the text uh, and peace to Sister Ariella uh, on Facebook and Jackie Wallace uh, and anybody else who was watching you know, on Facebook. So uh, this text is, is not really that big. So as you can see, it is small um, or, is, you know, uh, is it's smaller than a six by nine book, or it may be, I haven't read any six by nine books in a minute, um, but I think it's a little smaller than a six by nine uh, text. And from front to back, it is approximately 234 pages. So it's not that big. The font is kind of small. Um, <laughs> let me see. Uh, and it is approximately... Let me see how many chapters we have. Um, the book is broken up into two parts, a part one and a part two. So phonemes and phones. Uh, I see, I see. So we won't be joined by Brother Wujawu today, but um, maybe we can have another uh, conversation about the text. Uh, you know, when we both have read through uh, this particular text. But as I was saying, um, it's broken up into two parts. Uh, let me let me go back first. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping. So again, the text is called Ancient Egyptian Phonology and it's produced or published by Cambridge University Press. And I don't know if he has a contract with him, but most of his books are produced by Cambridge University Press. And let me see, there is a hardback version of it. This book was like 23, 20, and let's just round it up to $25, um, which is a very reasonable price, uh, especially for a text of this subject. And so you normally don't find books this cheap on subject matter like this. And so, you know, they usually try to hike it up because one, this is a linguistic text and two, it's a, a linguistic text dealing with ancient Egyptian. So it is a very narrow market. And um, so, you know, it's, it's good that it was, you know, priced at uh, roughly $25. It's like $23, but I'm, I'm rounding it up on uh, at least on amazon so you know it's not a real long intro he has a preface and then he just gets right into it you know starting with um part one which is the phone names and the phones uh dealing with the sound and then part two the phonological analysis and so the part one consists of chapters one through nine and then part two consists of chapters ten through 13 and then there are two appendix or uh, appendices i should say then the bibliography and references and then the index 
And so again, we're looking at 234 pages. Now, um, show us the page. And I actually bought myself a, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. I bought myself the PDF version. Uh, so when I'm traveling and I can't hold the book in hand, I have a PDF version. Um, let me see. I'm just going to share my entire screen. So share. Let's move that out of the way. Let's go here exclusively. So... We'll go here. So I'm looking at my other devices to see if it has shown up. Okay, there we go. So here's the text, ancient Egyptian phonology. And, you know, uh, gives a little brief breakdown of the book. Again, James P. Allen, Cambridge University, is broken down into the two parts, as I said before. Part um, There's a preface, and then part one, phonemes and phones, Coptic, Demonic, Late Egyptian, Middle Egyptian, Old Egyptian, phonemes, phones, phonotactics, prosody, and dialects. Uh, and then verb root stems, verb forms, uh, Y in the pyramid text, and vocalizing Egyptian. And so, uh, and then, you know, previous studies as far as Appendix A and then on transcription on Appendix B. And so, again, I have not fully read this text, but I did glance and read parts of it. And then I did read the, the preface, uh, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2. And so, uh, you know, I'll have more to say as time goes by and I have actually read and gone through it and feel that I understood the points that the author is making. Now, again, the, the issue, the challenge with ancient Egyptian is that we don't know how it sounds. So there are many, you know, different analyses concerning how Egyptian was probably set, probably pronounced. And so, like he he does this appendix here uh, on the previous studies. So if you want to know what authors in general, you know, have written about and, and proposed, you know, different pronunciations and, and vocalizations for Egyptian words, uh, you know, he, he gives a good literature review, but that's at the end in the appendix A. And then he has his own analysis on transcription. And so, you know, uh, kind of, you know, he gives his, his, his thoughts on how the Egyptian language is transcribed currently. And so one of the things that I appreciate about this text, however, is that, uh, let me, let me do something here. I'm going to not, let me see, yeah, I'm going to do that. So, boom. <laughs> so, one of the things that I can appreciate uh, about this text here is that, you know, he acknowledges something that, you know, African scholars have been saying for the longest, and that is the beginnings of Egyptology and their linguistic analyses concerning the text have been Semitic centric. And that is because they believed there are a number of scholars and there's still a lot of them today who believe that the Egyptian language came out of proto-Semitic, like it's an early branch off of proto-Semitic. And so you know, a lot of literature, a lot of scholarship has been focused in trying to justify the relationship between 
Semitic and the ancient Egyptian. And this has led to a lot of false equivalencies in terms of the sounds of the language and pronunciation. So if you are trying to, you know, vocalize and hear the Egyptian language, if you hear it in like popular movies like The Mummy, you'll know that it doesn't quite sound like it just doesn't have that African flavor to it. And that is, and there's a reason behind that. And that is, again, because these scholars have been trying to make the ancient Egyptian language as well as the culture and people equivalent to those who dominate and currently speak Semitic languages in the quote unquote Near East. And so he acknowledges this and, and argues that if we're going to tackle the pronunciation and the phonology problem of Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom and Late Egyptian, then we're going to have to do an internal analysis and base it strictly on the Egyptian language itself. And so he, he is quick to acknowledge that just because you find a correspondence in another language does not mean that the sounds in that other language match exactly the sounds in Egyptian. And so that has been the methodology that other scholars have used with Semitic. Oh, this appears to correspond with this word in Arabic Therefore, the Egyptian must have these sounds to match the ones that are in Arabic. And that's a no-no in linguistics, especially since Africanists have a real big problem with actually doing the historical comparative method. And so because they don't do that, you know, there's been a lot of guesswork behind the values of the, the phonology. So this is something that he tackles in the, the first part of the text. And, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, so again, he starts off with Coptic, gives you a little background on Coptic and what the graphings mean. There's going to be a little bit of a learning curve for those of you who are not really into linguistics. And this isn't a concern for you on a daily basis. Um, so you will kind of have to know about IPA symbols, you know, how to pronounce those symbols and, or, or pronounce the sounds that the symbols represent. And, um, you know, and you, you have to be familiar with the Coptic script and, and things of this nature. So the author assumes that you already have a background in ancient Egyptian studies and more so the ancient Egyptian script. And so, you know, here's the uh, pronunciation in terms of the, uh, the Coptic sounds. And so we know that Coptic borrowed much of its script from the Greeks. And, you know, it kept some values from Demotic uh, for the sounds that the Greek did not have. And um, so, you know, this is important to know. But, you know, uh, for those who are familiar with this, it is a, a very good reference uh, text along these lines. So he starts from the latest so-called stage of the language, which is Coptic, and then he works backwards. So the next chapter will be Demotic, and then Late Egyptian, and then... Middle Egyptian, and then Old Kingdom. And so this is what you see here. So again, here's Demotic. And let me see. There is, um, where do I want to go? I want to stress that, you know, even though he makes this, you know, leap, in terms of acknowledging the Semeto-centric uh, 
basis for the early Egyptology and, and basically even, especially among the German school of Egyptologists, the, the pronunciation um, that, that was associated with the Semites or Semitic speakers, he still has a great limitation. And that is he is still uh, within the Afroasiatic paradigm. And so you can see here on page 77 that he, you know, again, he's, he's talking about uh, in this section here why the, the argument that Egyptian uh, it comes from proto-Semitic is erroneous. Um, and, but again, so what he argues is that, you know, there was proto Afroasiatic and then proto Hamitic. And so we can, you know, we can already see that this is problematic because he's still holding on to the Hamitic hypothesis. And then, you know, uh, so he's, he's saying that these three branches here evolved and separated from proto Afroasiatic and evolved into their own language and language families. So this proto hamitic is basically all of the other languages in proto uh, in Afro in the Afroasiatic phylum. And that includes Cushitic and that includes Omotic, that includes Chadic, and that includes Berber. And then Egyptian is its own thing and then proto Semitic becomes its own thing. And so this is, you know, one of the major problems I have uh, with this text thus far. So, but, you know, knowing the work of James P. Allen, I expected this. So I'm not, I'm not surprised at all, you know, uh, from him holding on to the Afroasiatic hypothesis. And, but as a result of that, you know, I can only expect so much from this text because one of the things that I, I notice when looking at this text is that there's really no comparative analysis whatsoever. So I know that he wants to deal with internal values, but it's problematic when you're trying to do it uh, simply an internal analysis if you're arguing that you don't know how the sounds are pronounced. And so unless you do a systematic external comparison with a group of related languages, you, you really can't confirm and verify the reflexes that you are going to find in Egyptian. And so even though they're not equivalent in terms of the other languages, it will let you know the context in which you know, the, the sounds more likely fall into the, the phonetic environment that the sounds, uh, evolved into, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's no comparative analysis whatsoever in here, save for example, you know, other Semitic languages. So it, it, it's interesting that he spends a lot of time talking about how the early researchers were Semitic centric, but yet his only comparisons, the few that he does in this, this entire book are all based on Semitic. And so, you know, he loses major points already for that. And so, you know, uh, again, I have you know, and, and I don't know if, you know, whoever has this book already has checked out page 89, but this is one of the reasons why I get PDF so I can zoom in uh, on the text. So this is dealing with the uh, compatible, the consonant compatibilities, you know, in the language, but in the actual physical text, it is, it is very small. And, you know, so we, we, can already see that it's probably printing at a 10 point font. So, you know, when you reduce it beyond 10 points, it, you know, you need glasses. So this book was made for people who wear glasses and the like. Uh, 
so you know i don't even know if this can really capture if you can see uh, i can't fully see because my screen is you know uh, express big but i think the camera is still on uh you can see you know how small it is here so be prepared for small text so you for those who whose vision isn't the best you want to make sure that you are wearing your glasses uh but you know the it's pretty standard stuff there's some things he deviates with uh on this but there's 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 something unique uh about this and that is if we go to what page do we he starts this it should be the last chapter vocalizing ancient egyptian which is chapter 13 starting on page like 161 uh, cancel. Uh, um, you will see that he tries to vocalize. So he he uses his analysis and creates a vocalization for the different time periods. Uh, so you can see here, this is the vocalizing Egyptian chapter. And so he acknowledges that, you know, Coptic, of course, is a bit more easy to pronounce because we know how it is pronounced is still spoken to this day in terms of the clergy. Um, but he's basing his his phonology on Coptic and in and, and combination with foreign uh, pronunciations in the cuneiform script. And so, you know, from that, he reconstructs uh, a vocalization pattern also based on you know certain compatibility rules and uh syllable and stress rules and issues to that nature you know won't get into the detail of what that means but you can see here how he is to pronounce these and so this is what is this first one i think it's john 10 1 and 4 in terms of Coptic. So we have Hamina, Hamintido, or oh, I don't know if that's supposed to be emphatic or this is supposed to be a glottal. Um, again, I haven't read the text fully, so um, I, I will see what all his symbols mean, but it's Netin, Jepete, Nefnu, In, Hit, Don, Pro, Ahun, Anessa. You know, I, it's just, I don't know how he's pronouncing all of this. I would I would love to hear him uh, try to pronounce this stuff live. And what's interesting is I try to look up James P. Allen like on YouTube. I don't see any YouTube videos of him. He's like 75 years of age and there's not one video of him, you know, speaking, giving a lecture, nothing. And uh, so that's going to be, you know, interesting to find. So we know what it looks like. Well, this is supposed to be Middle Egypt. No, this is demotic. So he goes through different texts. He gives you the transliterations, you know, saying like this, Jeset uh, Nef, you know, Eric uh, Pe. And so, you know, when it comes to vocalizing this, he, he says it's Jidas uh, Nef Akape Nepek Ache Ocheya I don't know if that's supposed to be again. I'm assuming this is supposed to be a glottal stop here. Peteak uh, Um It just sounds real crazy, you know. But this is his attempt, uh, <laughs> you know, of vocalizations. Now, and, and I'll try to, you know, pronounce this better using the IPA vocalization patterns. But yeah, this is. You know, very interesting. So this is one of the first that I've seen, you know, because you have uh, Pust, uh, Karstein Pust, 1999 work on, you know, vocalizing, uh, you know, a, a dead language in terms of the ancient Egyptian. But he doesn't try to, you know, provide. I don't remember. Again, my book is in Philly, and, but I don't remember him trying to actually vocalize uh, live text. So, 
Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, you know, if you know you're into linguistics, that'll be something you know interesting to uh, you know to go over. And so, but all in all, you know, this looks like a very interesting text. I might give an update in terms of how, you know, my, my full thoughts of my, my preliminary thoughts with just a brief read is that it is, you know, it leaves much to be desired. I still don't see any, uh, comparisons, but that's to be expected with those who, you know, adhere to the Afroasiatic hypothesis. They are never known. Uh, I have yet to find a good text where they actually compare the ancient Egyptian systematically with, with any of the uh, so-called Semitic languages. And, but nonetheless, you know, this is this is something that I'm interested in. So uh, I will, you know, read it objectively and, you know, take what is valuable and to see what he changed. He even acknowledges that there's some things that in terms of his thoughts that has changed since his 2013 linguistic work on the ancient Egyptian. So I assume that there's going to be a um, a second edition of that text with his updated analysis and that happens you know like there's some stuff that i'll definitely be changing in the Luja, uh volume one that came out in 2013 and so there'll be a second edition of that with some changes and you know that's just the nature of scholarship itself <laughs> um let me see what's y'all saying in the chat. Um, let me see. I see Ujawu says readers will have to be familiar with the IPA system. Yes, you will. Again, it's a linguistic book. So this isn't just, you know, you're not going to learn how to read and write hieroglyphs with this text. It is, you know, for those who are interested in trying to pronounce the words of ancient Egyptian. And so I just wanted to check and see what his analysis is. And so, you know, of course, he doesn't recognize any African scholars on the question of phonology of ancient Egyptian, like Jean-Claude Mboli or uh, Abu Bukri Musalam or uh, Theophilo Benga you know, because that's what they do. But so the last person that he really recognizes was Pust in this 1999 work and then people who, you know, before him that have done it. So, but um, I would have loved to have, you know, him to review somebody like Mboli and, and in terms of the methods that he used when reconstructing the sounds of ancient Egyptian. But uh, yeah, you you have to know, and IPA stands for the International Phonetic Association. Uh, they gotten together and created symbols to represent every sound in the human language, uh, in human languages across the world. So uh, he says, you can't even buy the book unless you know the IPA sounds. Uh, man, this is from Sister Mika. Uh, I wouldn't say that th that is the case. You know, there's certain books like I have certain German books that I have yet to fully understand and, and read German, but I get them because that's on my to do list. And I get books because, you know, you never know when they're going to come out of print. And so, you know, I get them and I'm going to read it later. You know, even books that I understand, I'll get certain texts, put it away and I'll read it later. You know, because if, if a book goes out of print, then you have people who buy them and then, you know, jack up the price. So this little twenty three, twenty four dollar book, you know, in a year or two would be sixty something, one hundred seventy nine dollars on, you know, Amazon if they don't do another print run, which I doubt. 
But um, so, yeah, get the book and learn the IPA while you're reading the book. But, you know, there is a learning curve again, because this is dealing with linguistics itself. It's not a it's not a casual book. Um, let me see. He says um, this is Wujawu again. He has Yemen as Haming. Yeah. Um, and you said something over here. He says, no matter what, when they do it in terms of the trying to vocalize, they sound like Arabic speakers speaking Arabic. And I agree. Um, he says, Jesed Nef, he has Jidas Nef with stress on the second syllable. I said, you know, like, Didas Nef. Um, let me see. Uh, Jehuti Ma'at says it sounds German. That's just probably me and my bad pronunciation. So, uh, but I, I would love to hear James P. Allen try to pronounce it. Um, he says, how it sounds, the way they call themselves Kemet. I don't know what you're trying to say, Cassius Clay. Uh, if you can rephrase it, then I can, you know, make sense of it. Yakorel, he says, looks like a poor job to me. Can't wait for the next book by Jean-Claude and Boley. Uh, me too. And I know Jean-Claude and Boley is working on a text dealing with um, the beginnings of Proto-Semitic and Proto-Indo-European in relationship to Negro Egyptian. And so, you know, we eagerly await that text. Um, but, you know, yeah, there was, there's nothing to, I didn't have a, a show planned. It was just, I got a new book and I thought I'd share, oop, already dropping it. I thought I'd share um, what I get instead of normally just posting a picture, you know, on Facebook, like, boom, new book in sign. You know, uh, I, I thought I'd have some dialogue about it. Um, and so, yeah, but it also underscores for us who are, are African scholars of ancient Egyptian, we have to do our own text. Now, Brother Wujawu and I, you know, uh, were part of a team that was attempting to, uh, do to revitalize the ancient Egyptian language is headed by Dr. Uh, Riketi uh, Amin, you know, who's a, you know, well-known uh, Egyptologist and scholar of the ancient Egyptian language. Uh, you know, there was a number of other folks involved, um, but I guess due to logistics and things, things really didn't, you know, get off the ground. And, you know, so hopefully, you know, with a more organized attempt, we can come back and address, you know, um, the, the shortcomings of the first attempt and get back to it. But, you know, just wanted to show this to show that other folks are are serious about this work and they are getting it done. Even though I have an issue how they're getting it done, they're getting it done nonetheless. So for those of us who are, you know, serious about this work, this should be something that the African school needs to uh, put its, 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 its stamp on and, and make its contribution in terms of a, a, a single text dedicated to ancient Egyptian phonology. So uh, I look forward to that in the future. But, you know, thank you all for listening. I have nothing else to say, but y'all have a blessed day, and I will see y'all later. All right, peace.